Uh, thanks, everybody. It's very uh, good to be here, um, simply because um, this is a presentation which tries to contextualise, in some respects, my academic history in terms of my critical approach to business and approaches to business management with my contemporary interest in why games and play are actually something that businesses should be interested in, um, yet at the same time they should be doing so in a much more ethical way than many consultants and uh, organisations would perhaps lead you to believe. So this is very much an overview presentation. It assumes that you don't have any background in business management, critical management studies, um, but there are some sections that I will sort of whiz over um, because they're fairly sort of standard concepts. So for example, I'll talk a little bit about um, theories of motivation, but I'm not going to go into them in any depth because it's not really what the presentation is about. Um, so what I really wanted to do to start was talk about why businesses are interested in games. Now, if you speak to businesses about why they're interested in games, they'll probably talk about the first two of those possibilities. The idea that games can perhaps help them develop better motivation and engagement among their employees, or that it can help improve their organizational processes, either to be more efficient or to be more innovative and so on. Um, those two things, the focus, um, first of all, on people, and then secondly, on process, is something that obviously managers are very um, concerned about in their day-to-day -day, uh, interactions and goings on. However, when we look more critically at management theory and some of the ways in which um, games and gamification in business is being discussed um, in the literature, we have these two other possibilities. Um, so the actual management of work or the control and supervision of workers is one aspect that's being extensively discussed. And then finally, a critical reimagining of what work is and what it means in our society. Now, that last one is one that most everyday managers probably would not give you as an answer when asking why are businesses interested in games. However, I would say that that doesn't mean that this is not um, deeply um, underlying a lot of the things that may well be going on culturally in our society at this time. So I think it's quite um, useful and valuable to think about that. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about this question at the bottom of this next slide, which is, is business a game? Now, I've introduced that question partly as a flippant query, but partly um, reflecting that final category, the question of, what it is that we're doing with games in work. Are we reimagining work in a different way for our contemporary society? Um, so first of all, two concepts which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. The first, the concept of the magic circle from Johann Huizinga. Um, the notion that when we establish a play or game space, we are establishing a social environment which is in some way different or special. Um, and in Homo Ludens, his anger discusses um, the examples of law courts and religious ritual um, as things that perhaps emerge culturally after um, a play process has um, initiated them. So he talks about how um, playing or reenacting the stories of the gods become religious rituals and ceremonies. Um, so we've got these special spaces where the rules that apply in ordinary life are suspended and different rules apply. Um, and these play arrangements are not necessarily facile. They're not necessarily non-serious. Again, um, he highlights particular historical examples um, such as uh, Mortal Kombat over um, people's guilt, for example. So these can have deadly consequences. Just because they're a, a magic circle or a game doesn't mean that they're not serious. And then we have the um, oft extended and debated um, element of the distinction between play and game, um, which I, again, I don't intend to go into in particular depth here. I think it was more than adequately covered at a previous talk, so um, I won't go and uh, 
uh, sort of treat you like you don't know what I'm talking about and the difference between the two things. Um, but um, if we think about the similarities between the two concepts of play and game, um, I think we can identify that they're both freely chosen activities. Um, and the distinction is that games, perhaps, uh, as far as Heising is concerned anyway, um, we already know the rules before we enter into the, the play space, or we've already had some notion of how we should practice this play activity. Um, so that leads my, to my question, is business a game? Because frankly, the business sphere is one that quite often we hold as separate to ordinary and everyday life. The rules are special and different. We learn how to behave in a business environment um, in a number of socialising activities that we experience in the transition from youth to adulthood. And part of discovering how to represent ourselves in paper, such as curriculum vitae and so on, is all part and parcel of what we might describe as a gamified process. Um, so in that sense, we could talk about how entering the world of business is entering a game. Then we could also talk about how business itself is a game of changing the social and material world. Um, if you think about how we talk about economics and the market um, in political discourse, again, it is almost treated as if it is a separate world to our um, social and political world. Um, the legal structures around business and corporations, for example, the institution of limited liability in and of itself creates corporate persons who inhabit this game space of business. It's not um, the CEO of a given firm that is the entity that is damaged um, should a firm go under. Their reputation may well be affected, um, but they are held to be separate entities. And that legal distinction, again, sets business apart as perhaps having its own social circle. Um, so. That's me just kind of setting up this question about how we can think about business as a game and start thinking about it analytically in that context. But a slight disclaimer. Um, Hamilton, in 2009, um, wrote a paper that was published in the Journal of Business Ethics um, and warns against the metaphoric fallacy of discussing business as a game or a sport, um, particularly as a dangerous route um, in the sense that by using sporting metaphors when talking about business, we're often overlooking the serious social and ethical implications of making particular business choices. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that in asking this question, is business a, ga a game? I do not intend to promote that metaphoric use of the game. I'm using it in the sense of um, Heisinger's idea of play preceding culture as an analytical tool to try and understand and shine a different theoretical lens onto what businesses do and how they operate. Um, so I entirely agree with Hamilton that this is something to be worried about. But to start with this first dimension then, motivation and engagement. The people that inhabit organizations and play these games. Well, first of all, the concept of games occurring as part of work is neither new nor to be affiliated entirely with the digital or half digital lives that many of us now um, inhabit. We can talk about uh, the invisible hand of the market, as I've suggested, the very concept of an economic space being separate as being a playing space or a game space. Um, if we look back at some of the original theoretical work on bureaucracy and setting rules down as to how we ought to organize um, from Max Weber in the very sort of like last, last century, um, there's this idea that jurisdiction is limited. Okay, so we have fixed roles in organizations and we can only act within the jurisdiction of our role. So it's beginning to sound very much like a game manual, right? Some of the 
the extensive um, rules and regulations around work that were very common at that time and still persist in many organizations today. Then um, there are a multitude of studies from the 1970s and onwards, um, and even earlier if we wanted to take this lens and apply it to the Taylorist studies um, around scientific management and things like the time and motion studies um, around the early analysis of factory work, where there's this concept that workers are only interested in getting their paycheck at the end of the day, they are in fact in opposition to the owners or the managers of the firm. Um, and they don't necessarily know the best way to perform their job effectively. Or even if they know it, they're not motivated to achieve it. Instead, they are motivated to engage in soldiering, which is basically to laze about as long as the boss doesn't catch you. Um, so there's this concept of a war between employees and management. And that has been looked at in the context of um, war as a game in the workplace. And then again, to go back to this notion of um, games as metaphor, there's extensive histories of the use of simulation and strategic planning that draws on um, warlike games and strategy simulation, um, where we can look at um, historical examples of getting managers to read the art of war, um, and also contemporary work around Porter's strategic theories around the five forces and things like game theory. Um, this is all being perpetuated on MBA programs across the world. So there's this notion that managers are being trained to think of themselves as gamers in the business environment. Another way to look at it is to look at the way in which games have emerged as worker activities. Um, so in 1969, Donald Roy wrote um, a fabulous piece of um, in-depth ethnographic research um, entitled Banana Time, which talks about the um, monotony of working in a factory and how he struggled to get through the working day without creating games for himself initially. Um, so he talks about operating a die cutting machine and promising himself, once I've done 100 sheets of blue, I'll move on to the red ones. He then talks about how working in an informal group setting in the same factory um, resulted in the emergence of all kinds of social games between him and the other employees. Um, and he describes how the working day was structured around things like Coke time, which is when someone would agree to go to the vending machine and get everybody a Coke. And also banana time, which is when ritually, every day without fail, people in the workplace would steal somebody's banana from their packed lunch. Um, so hence banana time, the name of the paper. Um, and then finally, if we look at a lot of contemporary management theory which talks about lean and agile methodologies, this too has a basis in games and trying to eliminate waste and be more efficient. Um, and if you don't think that total quality management and scrum methodologies has nothing to do with games, I do encourage you to play Overcooked or any other game that requires resource management. And you'll see that there is a very direct correlation between the processes that are being taught to project managers alongside the processes that are being used as something that we play supposedly for fun and enjoyment. <laughs> so when we're thinking about this and the gamification of work, I think it's important to consider that we have a history around theories of motivation and goal setting um, in studies of organization and management, um, where a lot of contemporary approaches embrace these concepts of motivation which suggest that managers and workers' interests are fundamentally in alignment. Whereas if we go back to, um, I have added these uh, titles because they're um, impactful rather than because they're analytical. If we go back to McGregor's theory X, which was the concept fundamentally that workers were more or less rational but also more or less lazy and wouldn't really do things unless they were told you'll get a pay bonus unless if you achieve this limit etc etc um, you have this concept of workers who are engaged in servitude right so they're motivated in as much as there are very clear very self-evident 
um, positive or negative reinforcements to their behaviours. Um, we then have, so again that's sort of the 1950s and earlier we're talking about that. Then between the 60s, 70s, all the way through to the 90s and very much I think flow is still um, in the contemporary debates now, we see a shift away from this idea of oppositional relations between workers and management um, through first the idea that workers are motivated by responsibility for their work, which is where we find um, some of the initial work around things like quality circles, um, to uh, workers being engaged in social participation in the workplace and fulfilling those needs and desires through to attempting to achieve a balance between challenge, capabilities and reward, which is where we see the contemporary work on flow. Now, of course, the contemporary work on flow is associated with um, positive psychology, but has been very, um, uh, very embedded in the design literature around games. And this is where we find a lot of correlation between um, contemporary consultant materials on why businesses should have games, okay? Um, particularly why businesses should employ consultants to design games for them. And this is where we start to see this focus on organizational processes. So games, instead of emerging or correlating between business activity and what's going on in the inhabitants of the organization. Instead, we see this intentional intervention in organizational processes um, through the introduction of games and competition. Um, so on the one hand, we see things like very simple goal setting. And again, this has been go going on for decades and decades. Um, things like leaderboards, employee of the month, performance related pay, rewards and incentives, again, go back to um, very early factory work, um, you see it in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and then what you can see on the right here is actually a um, leaderboard that is being recommended, a digitized version for um, contemporary car sales representatives. So not a lot changing in that respect. Um, but increasingly we also see it used with things like digital badging for non-function oriented goals. So organisations are embracing the idea that they should not only be using these techniques to meet their targets, achieve more output, make more sales, but also to enhance their employee well-being, um, encourage them to engage in charitable activities, build it into their CSR planning and so on. It's strange, I know, but CSR, corporate social responsibility activity. Um, so, for example, um, there are quite a lot of uh, organisations who try to incentivise their employees to do volunteering for their designated charity. When I say incentivise, <laughs> it's uh, sometimes more required than <laughs> voluntary work. Um, and then we see the, the rise of gamification and gamification consultancy. Um, I didn't want to get into intensive and in-depth debates around uh, definitions of gamification, but I have taken this, from, this one from um, Coivisto in 2017, which is a sort of amalgam of Detterding and a number of the other very well-known um, definitions of gamification. Um, and it's very ambiguous, but this idea of supporting user value creation um, using intentional game-like affordances or design uh, principles in order to produce psychological and behavioral outcomes generally outside of a uniquely game context. So this idea that gamification is taking the principles of game design out of a game context, plugging them into a work context, intentionally in order to try and improve motivation, psychological outcomes, behavioral outcomes, actual um, behaviors in the workplace, and so on. But we see this happening not only in a production context, in um, businesses, but also in a consumption context. So it's widely being employed in marketing, as well as being employed um, to uh, actually interact with employees. 
Um, so we can look at things like uh, the use of scenarios and play as part of strategy education and planning. Um, this is the big Lego series play thing at the moment, right? Okay. And I won't say that uh, Lego series play is not useful for strategy education and planning, but at the same time, there's a very interesting correlation between pay us more money to be trained to use these more expensive produ products for strategy education because who are the people who are going to pay money for strategy education? The top level executives who have access to the most funds. Um, then we have the long history of using games as part of team building and enhancing uh, team relationships. So focusing on the psychological outcomes between employees in order to hopefully enhance um, behavioral uh, achievements. Um, but we can still go back to things like the target tell game, which has been used as a an initial marker point or point of analysis, which was, again, very much this idea of um, a sort of a performance-related game that was embedded in the, the till process at Target at stores to try and motivate workers to be faster, things like that. Um, and then we see what I think is quite interesting, uh, a bit of a distinction between simulation training, um, which is the use of scenarios, and compliance training, which seems to use narratives. So um, I'm not sure if that's a meaningful distinction or a distinction that I've just drawn in terms of the different products that are, appear to be out there on the market. Um, but compliance training, from what I gather, seems to be this idea that we can gamify something that people don't want to do, and that will motivate them to do it. Whereas simulation training is more a case of we have to embed these skills for possible future scenarios. So it's, it's a bit more, it's a bit less motivational and a bit more about what could possibly go wrong in terms of a, a training outcome. And then if we look at consumer engagement, of course there's a long history of the use of competitions and buyer incentives and so on, but increasingly in entertainment marketing, seeing a lot more gamification, the use of games in order to spread the word about new products. So I don't suspect that there's anything in that list that you have not heard of in one way or another, but I thought it might be useful to cover the ways in which these activities are being introduced at various different levels of the organizational process. What I think is interesting is the way in which they are occurring not only at consumption and production level, but at production level, they're also occurring at a variety of different levels of the organization. So there's gamification of onboarding procedures. So when you recruit people, and then there's gamification for executive training. So it's, it's encompassing the, the whole swath of the organizational chart. But this is where it gets interesting in terms of thinking about um, the management of work and what function this gamification might also be um, enacting beyond the concept of giving people skills or um, information so that the company is compliant. So first of all, we have um, the opportunity of using games as part of supervision and discipline. Um, so panopticism or the panopticon, can you just wave if that's something you've not heard of? No. Right, okay. Yeah, yep, prison that's the one. Yeah. Um, so the panopticon is extensively discussed in terms of organizational power relations because it's a great example of how you can use organizational infrastructure to convince employees to internalize discipline. So you don't have to rely on the manager standing over, supervising, watching someone to make them do something the right way. They don't know if they're being watched, therefore they internalize and they try to ensure that they're always behaving in a compliant manner. Um, so the issue is that contemporary games, um, what um, various different writers, um, including O'Donnell, have referred to as the game apocalypse, the um, extensive introduction of games into non-game activities and um, pervading everyday life. 
Um, operate in a two-way fashion um, increasingly as digital products. So they don't only communicate the game algorithm and the activity to the person engaging in it, but they also feedback analytics um, to the app owner, the manager, whoever it might be. Um, and that feedback process is an information generating mechanism. It's a surveillance mechanism. Um, so the employee of the month leaderboard is no longer just something that your manager is sticking on the wall. Um, it's something that you have an organization of 10,000 people and you can identify the low, lowest percentile performers and why. All right, so if you're uh, using some of these activities, you can actually analyticize um, all the sorts of things that your employees are doing. There's also the fact that by introducing gamification, there, this is the introduction of a simplifying schema to organizational practices, okay? Particularly in large companies, what um, is actually going on in the day-to-day -day operations of any given department is complex, political, there may be multiple objectives at any given point. Um, and by simplifying that down to a game using goals and targets, it's a, a gross simplification of what the objective of the overall organization might be about. So games introduce the concept that problems are predefined and have clear solutions. Information is unambiguous. Um, there are clear win criteria a lot of the time. And it also introduces the notion that the playing field is a fair one. Um, and quite frankly, if any of those things represent a contemporary workplace, I've yet to see one. <laughs> So this idea that uh, gamification um, is a representation of what's going on in the organization is, is very problematic. Um, but at the same time, we also have this notion of playing to resist, which we can track all the way back to um, games and soldiering introduced by employees as a means of messing about with managers, the sort of the war games of the early factory period. Um, the disruptive potential of play um, for employees is that by introducing games, by ludifying the work environment, you are allowing uh, employees to also introduce game modifications, game rules, um, different styles of play as mechanisms for engaging with your objectives. So there's a lot of potential there. Um, and there's some very interesting contemporary research on how uh, employees in using uh, apps, so employees working for firms such as Uber or Lyft or Deliveroo are trying to find interesting ways of playing the algorithm in order to resist um, the requirements of the sort of management, even though the manager in this sense is an app. Um, so things like, um, apparently, many airports have designated pickup points now. Um, you have to pay a fee to, be, to use these pickup points. Um, there are particular areas, geographical areas, where if your GPS says you are not within the right distance, you won't get allocated jobs from the airport, which are generally very lucrative. Um, so. Uh, Uber drivers, for example, are finding strange, like, odd corners, fields and things that are technically just inside the boundary so that they can get pickup jobs from the airport but they don't have to pay the fees, things like that. Um, and you, they have the opportunity to change the rules of the game by exposing the fact that the game is part of a magic circle, by puncturing that circle and saying, ah, but this way that you're managing us is, is just a game, isn't it? So actually, we can completely delete that as a non-serious way of achieving our objectives. And instead, if this is what you really want us to do, um, we can suggest alternative ways of doing that. So there, there are different ways in which um, the game framing can also be used as a mechanism for resistance rather than playing with the game or um, introducing your own games. Um, but there are limits to resistance. Again, we can go back to some of the 
early cultural studies um, such as Collinson 1988 engineering humor who basically points out that a lot of gameplay can help release tension but actually undermines the um, balance of power between employees and managers so uh, the culture of play can undermine resistance um, and if we look at some of the more contemporary research that's been done in Germany by Ant Alan Strauss, um, the existing relations and commitment to particular organizational identities, so I am a manager or I am a product owner, people are very committed in terms of their careers are tied up in those labels. So once you want to use play or once you want to engage playfully with organizational structures, you have to be willing to put those labels or those identities at risk. And sometimes that's a big risk for individuals um, in terms of the real consequences of doing that. Um, and then there are other factors of that as well with respect to the receptiveness, um, to the degree, the degree to which um, organizations have actually introduced and are committed to these um, processes of gamification, or to what point is it just a gloss um, on uh, harder underlying relations. And then, of course, there's the broader employment context. If you can walk out of your organization into another job, you might feel more able to playfully resist um, the new management technique than if the employment context is a little bit more challenging. So this approach really kind of looks at games as not a management tool but as part and parcel of a management ideology um, where we can either see games as hard power, direct serious interventions that are uh, specifically aligned to the organizational process um, things such as um, performance related pay that is embedded in a gamified algorithm which we can take um, uber as an example of that an extreme example of that um, and things like the game apocalypse the the extension of making the game be in charge instead of a person that you can maybe negotiate with and so on um, or we can also look at this in terms of the use of games as soft power. Um, so there's been quite a lot of discussion around uh, Playbar. I don't know if anybody's come across that. No? Um, so this relates primarily to um, Marxist arguments and an increasing debate around immaterial labor, digital labor, um, some of which is financially recompensed and some of which is not. Um, so in the context of people who are playing games, for example, who are playing games in order to produce uh, digital products that they can then sell for real money on a legitimate or illegitimate marketplace, gold farming, etc. cetera, um, there's the question that that is often illegitimate, but it's exploited labor, right? Um, and then furthermore, we can look at um, the way in which organizations, including game companies, actually require, in order for their product to be successful, an extensive amount of unpaid immaterial labor to contribute towards building their world, testing their um, mechanics, and so on. Um, and uh, Taylor et al. have also argued that um, this process actually promotes a particular neoliberal entrepreneurial subjectivity. In order to play this game, and maybe win, win, being a movable feast, um, you actually need to adopt this very conventional, hardworking, willing to spend many, many hours logged into the game, um, committed neoliberal subjectivity. And you see it, um, their analysis was focused on EVE Online. Um, but you see it in a lot of um, large MMORPGs. Um, back in 2005, um, Costia Crump and Holm suggested that this is actually part of a larger cultural shift. So in terms of the ideology of work, we're moving from um, an ideology based on self-discipline, the sort of the 
classical example being the Protestant work ethic, the idea that you work very hard um, in order for a moral benefit, not a financial benefit, um, towards um, a model of self-affirmation. So work is where we go to become better selves, but not in a moral sense, more in a sort of like self-actualization sense. Um, Morgan and Nelligan's book, which I confess I have not read fully, um, that's uh, come out recently, um, criticizes this as part of the creativity hoax. They said it's basically set dressing by organizations um, where <coughs> they, are, uh, they are projecting the idea of a ludic and gamified work experience in order to recruit people into jobs that are actually fundamentally quite meaningless and, and not actually all that self-affirming. Um, so there's those kind of multiple approaches to looking at how we can see gamification and the ludification of work environments as part and parcel of these broader ideological trends in how management gets the workers to work. But that's the dark side. So let's, let's try and end things on a slightly happier note, shall we? Reimagining work, the potential of play and play spaces. So initially, the potential of play to enhance work relies primarily on the idea that we can reject the mundane or we can glorify the ordinary. So there are a lot of uninspiring mundane tasks that we have to complete in our day-to-day -day life. For example, domestic labor, cleaning the dishes, doing your laundry, all of these activities need to be done. We might hope that we're gonna have a future of fabulous robot servants and this is not going to be necessary, but they were promising that 50 years ago and we're still not there. So instead, what we've got is we've got gamified apps which allow us to engage in that kind of activity in a way where it's still rubbish and not very enjoyable, um, but increasingly it's all right because I've got an app where I get XP for every time I do the dishes and it makes me feel better about it, right? And if you haven't used Epic when, you should. Um, so this glorification of the ordinary is happening in the workplace as well. The principle of play, where play is intrinsically motivating and freely chosen, perhaps unlike work, um, suggests that we can transform our work experience by making work more like play. Opening up the frame of work in that context, it also provides opportunities for a renegotiation of purpose and work identities. So play offers us a greater potential for work with meaning. Whether it's mundane work, where the meaning is being supplied through the gamification process, or whether it's actually an opportunity to reevaluate the actual functions of the work that we do and what businesses are doing in the first place in order to have more meaningful impacts in the world, that's also something play that as an play has the potential to do in terms of opening of up those objectives. More holistic work objectives as a medium for activities such as sense making and problem solving aesthetic and artistic interventions which diversify our approach to business functions, or simply through offering better design principles for enhancing the human experience of working relations. These approaches offer support for the expansion of social, ecological and political value creation, as well as economic gain. However, the dangers of application of gamification and play techniques where used solely for the purpose of extracting value through unrecognised labour or in attempts to infantilise and disempower workers and enhance exploitation remain serious, presenting both ethical and practical challenges for play implementation. In this context, business embracing games and play genuinely need to address the question, what are we playing for? The game apocalypse or gamification of everything without concern for transformative innovation and change does not truly add value to business as usual or enhance the capabilities of business organisations. We need to know what is at stake when we play 
and we need to take games seriously. Thank you for listening to the presentation. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe.